You're listening to Something Cheeky, a collection of podcasts where two sisters discuss TV, books, and movies with just enough reverence and far too many pop culture references. Welcome to Something Cheeky, the Gentleman Bastards edition, where we discuss Red Seas under Red Skies, book two of the series by Scott Lynch. I'm Nikki. I'm Rosanna. While I've read the entire series, Rosanna has only read up to what we're covering today, which is chapter two, Requin. In this chapter, Locke turns himself in and makes it out alive, only to be captured later by a mysterious woman. All right, Rosanna, what was your reaction to this chapter? This chapter left me frustrated. (laughs) Ah, how so? Well, so we get Locke telling this whole tale to Requiem, and I know it's BS the whole time, so I don't feel like I got anywhere. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, I got the story that's that Locke and Jean are, are going with, but I know that there has to be much more to it. And I know that, you know, Jean and Locke are not fighting like he's telling Requiem. So is it just Requiem? Is it, Oh, it's Requiem. <laughs> so it's Requiem. <laughs> <laughs> Requiem for a dream. Re- Requiem. Locke played by Jared Leto. <laughs> oh, God, no. Um, <laughs> so I know what Locke is telling Requin is not true. And so I feel like I, I feel like I'm Requin <laughs> getting this ah, fake story. Left out. But I know that, I know that there has to be more and I know it's going to take a while to get to it. And then at the end, when I feel like we're finally moving along <laughs> and, and getting somewhere, you know, <laughs> it just starts all over again. I mean, it's like the gray yeah. king and it's like the falconer and it's, these guys can't catch a break. <laughs> There's always another layer. Yes. I did really love the explanation of cheating the games. Ah, yeah. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. What was your favorite quote this time? This quote is by Jean. He said, I wish we still had bug, period. And Jean, (sighs) I wish we still had bug too. I really do. (laughs) I like that they're still talking about them and they're still remembering them. And, you know, even though it's hard... And it's sad. They're not trying to put it away. And they've grieved, I think, but they also still, you know, like to talk them about talk about them a little bit. Still miss them. Yeah. Sad. Yeah, they've they've moved past the grieving. I think you're right. But now it is just the just the memories. It's a nice memory to remember them, but then it hurts your heart to think about them. Yeah. Yeah. Poor boys. Mm-hmm. Let's get into the action. The chapter starts the day after the Night Market Bonds Magi threat parade. That was just a mess. And they just act like it didn't happen. Let's just, if, if they can't, (laughs) if we can't see them, they can't see us. (laughs) (laughs) I'm hiding behind a curtain and my feet are showing, but. (laughs) Exactly. No one can see me. We're just going to pretend it didn't happen and everything will be okay. (laughs) Wasn't that what, it was some guy and I think it was, was it Hamlet? Where the guy hid behind the curtain and he, they still knew he was there. Or maybe that was just a parody. God, it's been so long <laughs> since I've been that play. <laughs> Gosh, I don't, I don't know. I didn't ever read all of Hamlet. So that seems silly. When I was in college, I took a Shakespeare class in particular. Because what a surprise, I was English major. <laughs> and one of our projects was to somehow condense any Shakespearean play. Oh. And so my group... My group took Hamlet, and we made 15-minute Hamlet. Wow. And there were only four of us, so we had to play multiple characters. So we made placards on strings that we hung around our neck. (laughs) And we had to keep switching (laughs) to do our lines. Oh, my gosh. And we we modernized all the language and just really shortened it, and it was really, really fun to do. That's a fun project. It was ridiculous, especially when we... Because, of course, as you wouldn't be surprised to find out, we kept mixing up our placards by like halfway through. Right. And so I'd have the wrong name on me when I was saying a line. And, oh, that's and it was, funny. we were just talking so fast. It was, yeah, it was wild. It was really fun. I wish that I had a video of that. Oh yeah. That was back in the olden days when we didn't all have video cameras on our phones. I know. God, we're old. Or, or phones even. Did you have a phone in high school? I mean, in college? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Yeah, that was... 2004, yeah? I think I got... I don't remember how old I was when I got my first phone. But I don't really want to tell anybody how old I was. Because <laughs> then they'll try to guess how old I am. 
So we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Polonius, is that his name? I don't know. I don't know. That sounds right. I'll have to look it up. That does sound right. Back to Red Seas Under Red Skies. Oh, wait. There's no false light yeah. in Talvarar, which is... I thought it was especially strange because the whole place is made of elder glass. It's not just some tunnels here and there and some towers. Right. The islands are literally elder glass. Yeah. So it's weird that it is weird. you don't get false light. I, I would have imagined false light would be even stronger there. Yeah, I guess we just don't know how this stuff really works because it's uh, not real. <laughs> so we really don't. <laughs> we need more information. Lock and Jean, Lock and, sorry, Lock and Jean. That is going to be so hard to fix because I've had it in my head as Jean for so many years. Oh, yeah, more than me, but still, I'm I'm committed to Jean, so it's it's hard. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to keep working on it till I get it right. Okay. Jean, Jean, Jean. Locke and Jean say they would never hire a Bond's mage no matter how rich they get, unless they could somehow command them to go on some island off on their own and never come back. Mm-hmm. Locke is going to meet Requin and Cylindry alone, which is quite scary. What were you thinking at this point uh was going to happen or what, what did you think the story might be? I did not think he was going to confess to cheating. <laughs> that because that's seems, suicidal. Yes, that seems very dangerous. And then once it got to where that is what he was going to do, I couldn't figure out what good it would do to confess. <laughs> so I was, I, as usual, worried about him. Well, that was a serious risk. Solandry could have just killed him outright before he ever saw and got to talk to Requin in the first place. Oh, yeah, definitely. And I think she wanted to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she still wanted to at the end, too. Yeah. I mean, she doesn't She doesn't like him at all. No. Do you think it's just that it's because he's cheating, or well, do you think there's more to it? I, it seems like she cares too much than if it was mm. just cheating. She seems like she cares more than Requin. Yeah, maybe she's offended that he's so you know, callous about it. And so matter of fact, maybe that's offensive to her. And I, I guess it's, it more falls under her purview, her purview than Requin's. Right. Because she is the muscle, basically. Yeah. Or the head of the muscle at this place. That's weird. That's very anatomical. She's the head of the muscle. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm mixing my metaphors. <laughs> Oh, now I'm just picturing a teeny tiny little head like popping out of my arm. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's creepy. Mm-hmm. All right. He admits to cheating and he wants to tell Requin his motivations. Have we found out Requin's first name? It feels weird just calling him that over and over again. That's just what I was thinking he, his name was. So I don't know that we did hear a different name. Locke gets hauled upstairs. He gets to pass all the floors that he's never seen. And they look so fancy. Gosh, yeah. And they get up to the top. And I don't know why I was picturing this as an elevator, because they don't have elevators. <laughs> but they have a lot of <laughs> clock, what is it, me- clockwork mechanisms? Clockwork mechanisms, I think. So yeah. I bet they could make an elevator. It's almost steampunk. That's what I was going to say. This whole chapter just threw me into like a steampunk sort of, what are those books? <laughs> what are those books that are steampunk? You know, they're part a of the... specific series? Yeah, they're part of the, like, oh, shoot. Um, the Mortal Instruments has some, Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the Mortal... It's the Mortal Instruments, but they had... But there was another series, like, the same universe, but it was old-fashioned. It was, like, 1800s or something? The Dark Artifices series. Yes. Lady Midnight. The Dark Artifices series? Yes. Yes, that's... That's what this chapter reminded me of, that it was like, it's very old fashioned. It seems like it was set a long time ago, but then they have these sort of un- unexplainable modern devices, mm-hmm. especially like her hand. Yeah. Her hand really seems steampunk. Fancy. So. It does. And I'm okay with it going in this direction. I, I kind of dig steampunk. I think it's kind of cool. Now I just want Jamie Lannister to have blades in his hand. Oh my gosh, cool. yeah. Like Valerian steel blades. As long as he uses them to kill Cersei. Jeez. <sighs> if only. Oh my god, get rid of her. She's the worst. <laughs> I liked the sculptures that Locke saw as they got higher. They were basically just a pile of money, but with elder glass involved. And like fountain kind of kind of setups. 
Yeah, it felt very, uh, like, um, hmm. it's over the top. <laughs> Donald Trump. <laughs> it, it felt very overdone and really yes. just like in your face, like dynasty, 1980s giant hair, just like, look at all our money. <laughs> Everything gold plated. Yeah, it just, it was too, it was way too much. And then when they got to the one with his statue, with Requin's statue. Oh, yeah. I was like, get out of town, this guy. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> He's standing over the city. <laughs> He's too much. Pouring money out of his hands. Yeah. It's pretty on the nose. Yeah. It's always interesting to see those kinds of statues to get an idea of what the people think of themselves. Mm -hmm. Like his, I'm not sure if it was just done when he was younger, but it had, it was a little less unattractive than him. Right. Its hairline wasn't quite as far back. The nose wasn't quite as pointy. I assumed that it had been done when he was younger, but I still think even just having a statue of yourself says a lot about you. Oh yeah. I would never have a statue of myself. That's weird. (laughs) It really is. Judge you, McJudgerson. I have eight statues of myself, so whatever. <laughs> it's just, it's, um, it, it really is so over the top. Very narcissistic. And I wonder if after spending two years, um, that, that Locke has sort of keyed it on this narcissism and if he's planning on using that as a, a soft point ah. to get somewhere with Requin. I wonder how much he was actually able to find out about Requin in the first place. It seems like it'd be hard to get information on him. Yeah. I think it's pretty obvious now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reading the Dresden Files. I'm rereading all the Dresden Files again right now, and I'm on the last book that's currently out. And there's a, a scene where they're in Hades' vault, which is terrifying because it's the underworld and it's very scary. Yeah. But there is a, a statue of the fates. Uh-huh. And I think it's really interesting because... They look just like the fairy queens. So Hmm. the fairy queens apparently are also the fates. And so it's just mixing up all these, mixing up all the histories and the myths. Yeah, that makes sense to me. And now I keep, now I keep thinking about who is what and all that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really have much to do with this though. (laughs) Just that they're statues of people. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, also about the statues or the sculptures. We also find out that there are just untold numbers of elder glass pieces cast offs from from work that the eldren apparently did there are dealers specifically their entire guilds just in dealing with that kind of material which would be really cool yeah that it's so weird to think that there's just this stuff everywhere that they can't mold or change or shape at all it's or destroy it's so weird even. yeah yeah it's eternal material yeah. But I'm glad that it just keeps popping up everywhere even more in both large and small quantities. Yeah. Another part of the kind of steampunk feeling is that Solundry's metal hand mm-hmm. fits in a, a place and weighted down. It opens up a door with special clockwork built just for that. Yeah. I wonder how Requin gets in if he just has a plain old vanilla key <laughs> to get in the door. <laughs> and she's the only person that can get in besides him. Yeah. Maybe he has a secret entrance. Maybe. Like, um... Maybe he just... Like, Vercenza. Scales the wall. He's just Spider-Man. Oh, yeah. Vercenza. Yeah. I think he and Vercenza might get along. Yeah, probably. Maybe she'll go retire and, and tell Verar and play the Sin Spire with all her money. I kind of half expected her to show up at the end when Lot, oh, Lot yeah. got taken. I was like, oh, she came after him. Oh. She said she wasn't going to, but she did. <laughs> <laughs> but she didn't. Well, I don't know. She might have, but... I don't think the ch- now we don't really know yeah, yet. I don't think the chances are really good. Do you think that this mechanism to get into the door might come into play later? I ask because when I first read this, I immediately thought of a million and a half movies where they have to cut off the hand. <laughs> somebody needs to get through a retina scanner so they cut the eye out of somebody and get through holding up an eye and things like that. That did not occur to me. But I don't think about dismembering people regularly, so that could just be you. What a boring life you lead. Well, what can I say? I live in a small town and we don't dismember people that often. You just have a freezer full of dismembered animals in your garage. That's all. That's true. And then I eat them. That sounds so much creepier when it's said like that than just, (laughs) I have some meat in my freezer. Nope. 
I have animals in my freezer, <laughs> and I eat dismembered them. animals. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, sorry, vegetarian mom. <laughs> <laughs> She's like gagging, <laughs> listening right now. <laughs> Locke is searched. It seems like thoroughly, but not thoroughly enough, as we later find out. He loses his jacket and his shoes. His hair gets all mussed up. How did he even do that? How did he do that? Do what? Hide five decks of cards in his clothes? Yes, and they like felt him up, felt him up. How? And he is. A skinny dude. I, this makes... I don't... It's not like he could hide him under his man boobs or something. No, I don't understand it. How did he do it? I don't know. It's weird. He's luck. He, but he's... Probably sleight of hand. He's just a man. <laughs> I mean, I know he's good at stuff, but that's hard to believe. Oh, and also I noticed that they said it was a standard 56 card deck. Oh, I didn't catch which that. Which is weird, because standard decks are 52 cards. How many jokers usually come with a deck? Two or four? Four, I guess. Do you think he's counting jokers? I wonder if they count jokers. You don't count jokers in the normal deck, no. No. But I wonder if they have special joker-like cards. Yeah, I was going to say, they don't have jokers because they don't have any normal cards. When he when he was naming cards, I yeah. couldn't keep up. <laughs> that was smooth, though, getting the... Was it the Master of Spires card? Mm-hmm. To represent Requiem, which was perfect. Yeah, it was. Lot gets to see that the ninth floor is basically an apartment and kind of an office for Requiem. And there's also a room with a lot of fancy paintings in the office area, or maybe next to the office area, um, from the Throne Theron era. But all those artists are long dead now because they died in... Uh, the past? Uh, what, what do you want to call it? The, uh, what? the past? Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> no, Pawn's Magi takeover. <laughs> the demolition of Throne Theron, or the Theron Throne. We see Cylinder's hand have its kind of fold-back mechanism where it turns into two blades. And Requin has glasses that have this alchemical orange covering on them. And, of course, I only saw, like, futuristic movies with, uh, like, Google Glass kind of ideas. Very, like, the fifth element, or, kind of. Yeah. Did her glasses do anything in that movie? Uh, or I don't... Other, or, I, don't I never actually saw the fifth element. Wore orange glasses. You've never seen the fifth element? No. Oh, it's insane. I don't need to, because you have. See? It is... We are one mind. It is so insane. <laughs> and Locke very quickly gets his hand trapped in the box in the desk. So Cylindry can chop it off. Not very smooth. Do you think he knew about that before he went up there? No. He's, he <laughs> seemed surprised to me. He did. We also got to see boxes of withered old hands that had been chopped off previously. It's disgusting. Which is gross. Requin doesn't believe that Locke cheated with fast fingers and card sharping. And so Locke wants to show him a trick. So he gets out his first deck of cards and starts shuffling one-handed incredibly fast. I could barely shuffle with two hands, so I'm impressed. Keeps shuffling, says he can guess Requin's card, but keeps getting it wrong. Did you figure he was going to get to the right one and he was doing it on purpose? Yeah, I knew he was doing it on purpose. Yeah, he's too good to just make a joke like that. Yeah. So he has a second deck, and then a third deck, yep, until he finally has five decks, and he says, I could pull out more, but it might be from uh, places you don't really want to see the cards from. So he makes the correct card appear under the wine bottle. He's very good, still, just with one hand. Yeah. So Requin believes him and wants to hear how he beat all the games. And Locke didn't beat all of the games. He beat all the games that could be beaten with cheating mm -hmm. and he even said what you and i said there's no way to cheat the game right you have to cheat the people you have to cheat the people yeah. and that's Locke and jean's specialty mm -hmm. people so they explain how they drugged horvalor at carousel hazard where they had sprinkled the the narcotic powder on the cards and since she licked her fingers so much she went right down blind alliances was another game which actually sounds like a really funny game to watch where Partners have to sit across from each other, and everyone but the partner can see the person's cards. And so they have to try to work with instinct. I couldn't figure out how that was even set up. How can you see everyone's cards except your partner's? Well, if they have, like, a barrier in front of you in the right, just the right position. But how can you see everybody else's? If everyone has to lay them down flat, oh. and there's a certain... And you sit across from your partner. Okay. There could be a barrier just in front of you. I was thinking they were holding them in that... I, I 
couldn't make it make sense oh, in my head. Yeah. You're right. They were probably just on the table. And people have to have their feet touching someone else so they can't signal their partner. But Locke and Jean got fake boots made with iron tips so they could rest the fake boots on people's feet and it'd feel like they were still there while they were free to make signals with their... I'm just picturing them playing footsie and stocking feet under the table uh-huh. and no one noticing yep. for their signals. And billiards, which obviously are difficult to cheat, but they beat the man because they paid off this guy's doctor to find out he was allergic to lemons and they just covered themselves in lemon oil, which is so mean. I felt bad for that guy. Yeah, me too. I'm glad they didn't kill him. Yeah. This is when we learn about the con. And we know it's obviously a con. Franklin does not. We don't know how it's a con yet, <laughs> but we find out the basics of it. Uh, Locke says that he, as is Leo Conto, he's been hired to break into Requin's vault as soon as they figure out how. He and Jerome have. They've been cheating out of boredom, not because they needed to. They were hired by some anonymous party to figure out how to get into the vault. But Locke, Leo Conto, is tired of it, and he's tired of Jerome. They've apparently had a, a little tiff, so he wants to betray everybody and settle and tell Varar himself and get a job with Requin. He wants to be a floor boss, which he is well qualified to be at this point. (laughs) Yeah. And he wants to kill Jerome. If possible, he wants to be the one to kill Jerome. Were you surprised at that particular part of the story? Uh, I I was surprised that that was part of his plan that he was talking about, but I don't believe that it's true, so it doesn't really matter if he says it or not. At this point, I'm wondering what his reason is for not wanting... Jean to be part of this, or Jerome to be part of this, why does he need to get him out of the story? Is it just easier to keep up with with one person? Or what's the deal, I wonder? Or do they think it just made more sense for just one of them to want to become a traitor? I don't know. Locke has a way better imagination than I do. (laughs) (laughs) They always seem to have reasons for their particular parts of the story. Well, not always, I guess. Most of the time. Rickman doesn't think it's wise to let Locke go. And Solundry really doesn't want to let Locke go. But Locke says if they detained him, it would basically spill a beans to his employer. And then the whole plan, whatever this plan is, wouldn't work. Also, all their money is at the Sinspire. I think if I were Requin, I would have killed Locke. Ah. And Locke told him not to because his employer would just hire somebody else or something like that, right? Didn't he say something like that? Mm-hmm. But I think I'd be willing to risk that. Because <laughs> he just shows up and he flips his cards around and he talks about cheating. So he's very good at what he's doing, obviously. But Requin should know that most people aren't. So even uh, if somebody yeah. else was hired for this job, they're probably not going to be even as good as Locke was. I don't think he'd be risking that much killing Locke, believing this whole story. It seem- it makes more sense to me that he would kill him. I mean, I'm glad he didn't. I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't... I I... I... I imagine him less intelligent because he doesn't. Ah, uh, okay. Do you think Locke charmed him at all? Because he made him laugh a couple times with his card sharking, card sharping. Yeah, I think he did. Um, I think it's easy to be charmed by Locke, even if you don't want to be. Probably explains his relationship with Sabatha. I wouldn't know because I don't know anything about her. <laughs> so there you go. I also think he should have killed him if he if he were smart. This reminds me so much of when Locke and one of the Sansa twins played the Midnighters because it was a big risk to pretend to be someone, not just someone they weren't, but uh, more of a a double cross to pretend they were someone involved in a very large situation Yeah, that they weren't involved in in any way. Yeah. And just so risky and it takes a lot of balls to, to do that. Yeah. I mean, you have to really believe it. Yeah, Locke doesn't just do cons. He does serious. The depths of his deception are amazing. Yeah, I mean, he maybe he should have been an actor. <laughs> you know, like Gene says how <laughs> That's right. he liked the plays, you know, drama. I mean, yeah, he would be good at it. So on the topic of Locke trying to break into the vault, we know that the vault has uh, several layers of clockwork mechanisms that make it difficult Even just getting to the vault in the first place is difficult, nigh impossible, as Captain Jack Sparrow would say. (laughs) Just getting past all the guards, getting to the ninth floor in the first place, getting past Cylindry, getting inside the door that 
only her hand can get through in some of their mysterious key, we assume. Hmm. It's all very difficult. And Requin says, you have more chance of giving birth to a live hippopotamus <laughs> than the best thief alive has of making it past the cordon drawn around my vault. But this is silly. We could sit here all night contrasting cock lengths. I say mine is five feet long, you say yours is six, and shoots fire upon command. Let's hurry back to significant conversation. You admit that cheating the mechanisms of my game is out of the question. My vault is the most secure of all mechanisms, and I, therefore the flesh and blood you were presuming to fool, do you think that Locke... Well, we know that Locke fools the people, rather than the things in most cases. And it sounds like he's going to try to fool... Uh, try to fool Requin, even though he says it's possible this conversation represents me giving up that hope. Mm. But I'm sure you think that he is not giving up that hope. No. <laughs> uh, or do you think that there really is, that even though he and Jean are pretending to be someone else, do you think that someone has hired them to get into the vault? Uh, he never gives us a name. I'm leaning towards no. Okay. I, I'm not totally opposed to the idea that they are working for someone, but... As far as what we know about Sean and Locke, they don't need to work for someone. True. They don't they don't need to be hired for a job. They don't need a boss. They get what they want and they're good at getting it. So unless there's way, way more to the story, I just find it hard to believe that somebody hired them to break into a vault and they said, okay. Isn't there always way, way more to the story? Yes. <laughs> These books. I mean, heck, even even when we found out there was way more to the story in the lives of Locke Lamora, there was still, like, four other layers we hadn't even gotten to. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying completely no, that that's not it. I just, it seems more like them to not work for okay. somebody. Okay. Since Chains, yeah. And really, they didn't work for Chains. He wasn't their boss. He was their guardian, he, you know. Mentor. They were all working together as a team, not as employees of a person. Yeah. Rickman isn't just worried about someone hired to steal from him. He's worried it could be revenge. He says, a man with a grudge, a genuine grudge, might piss on all the white iron in the world for one chance at his real target. I've been that target too many times to forget this. But we're pretty sure Locke and John don't have any revenge they need to, to take out on Rickman. Right. Unless they need to take revenge out on his daughter or something. Now all that comes to mind is in the movie Cool Intentions, <laughs> Ryan Felipe's <laughs> character was seeing the therapist, but he was he wanted to get back at her, so he slept with his with the therapist's daughter and put up pictures of her on the internet. You never know. Always do. You never know when somebody's going to put pictures of you on the internet. <laughs> you really don't. <laughs> God, I wonder how many pictures of me are on the internet that I don't know about. Try doing like a reverse image search. I don't think that would face. work. It just works for like not. colors and shapes. It it would work for uh, the FBI, according to television. <laughs> <laughs> I can never follow that stuff because it just whenever they follow someone around a city with with facial recognition software, I just remember that Google Photos sometimes thinks that weird shapes on furniture or or people's faces. And tries to yeah. figure out who they are. So. Okay, well, as we may have mentioned before, my husband works in law enforcement. So try watching a cop show with that guy. Oh, God. This is what he says every about five minutes. Well, isn't that convenient? <laughs> <laughs> That's, he says that the entire show. I'm like, you know what? Never mind. Let's just watch something else. <laughs> <laughs> well, even just... Like, born identity style, trying to follow someone around a city with facial recognition. Just yeah. running facial recognition on mug shots takes forever. Grabbing yes. random picture, and running it on every single person on screen as thousands of people pass a camera, impossible. Yeah, and most... In that kind of time. Law enforcement agencies say, like, 90%, you know, not including the FBI, but just, like, regular law enforcement agencies, don't have anything close to that kind of technology. It's too expensive. Yeah. And they're... Things like CSI are always using, like, pictures from red light cameras and things. Except most of those are owned by contracted companies and not the police. Mm -hmm. So it's not like well, they're just I, getting into depends. the database. It depends. They could get a warrant for that information, but... But usually they're pulling it every, like, immediately. Yeah. Like, they have access to the database right away. Yeah. 
That's big brother. Likely. That's why. <laughs> I'm not nearly as worried about big brother because of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they don't know about my secret, secret terrorist organization or anything, but. Or how often you dismember people, so. Animals. Call them animals. So okay. People are suspicious. animals. That's true. I'm not lying. See? <laughs> my cover is not blown. <laughs> We'd be the worst criminals ever. <laughs> we We've just admitted it on a on a <laughs> podcast. <laughs> totally not us. We're just hiding in plain sight. It's fine. That's right. We're just pretending to be really stupid. <laughs> pretending? <laughs> <laughs> I read somewhere that because of shows like CSI and Law and Order and all that, it's a lot harder to convict people of violent crimes now because juries expect all this DNA evidence and um. it's actually a lot harder to get and to use. I think that's probably true. But I also wonder if it's easier to get confessions because people think you have Mm. access to that. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know very much about real stuff. (laughs) I don't know much (laughs) about real stuff. (laughs) Most most of my life revolves around fiction. (laughs) (laughs) That's a good point. Mine too. Oh my God. All right, listeners, if you ever get arrested for a crime and they say they might have some DNA evidence, don't they talk. Don't. Get your lawyer. Get your lawyer. Or it's going to be 22 years before it comes up in the lab to be tested because they're so far behind. Mm-hmm. I'm also not a lawyer, so you probably should take my <laughs> take the advice of your own lawyer, not me. <laughs> Somebody goes to court, they're like, Nikki from this podcast said that I shouldn't talk to you guys. So, uh, yeah, yeah. don't. Requin is going to watch them for a while and also check into their background. Thank God they do not have some steampunk internet where they can do background checks and find out about the Thorn of Kamor and everything. How do you even do a background check with no computer? Oh my God. What, what's even... You have to interview people. I mean, I guess you do that anyhow. But he's going to find out that they've only been there two years. How is he going to find out what happened before that? Without actually getting on a boat. <laughs> I wondered about that. I wonder if he'll be able to trace them back any further. Well, if he can find out how they got there in the first place, maybe he can find the ship and then get some ship's logs, captain's logs. It's a Star I Trek now. don't think those are the kind of ships they were uh, riding on. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't know how he expects to do this background check. But it does add a little risk that he may find out more than they want him to. That's always a possibility. You never know who's watching you. Or who's paying attention. Have you looked behind you recently, Rosanna? All that's behind me is a wall. That's what you think. (laughs) (laughs) I wonder if they use any carrier pigeon sort of things or Song of Ice and Fire kind of ravens to pass messages from place to place. (sighs) That would be handy. I I don't know. I don't know how else they'd get messages around faster than a ship. And maybe mail is just that slow. I can't imagine that's true, though. They have to use birds for something, you would think. I, yeah, I would think that. I feel like birds are used so much in fantasy as message carriers, but it's so rare for a book to recognize that a lot of those birds would be captured by larger birds ah. or shot down. Is it A Song of Ice and Fire that does mention that at some point? Oh, I don't remember. That book was so long and it's been a while yeah. since I read it. There's no way to remember every detail. Yeah. Even George R. R. Martin has people reminding him of how things went. Yep, I love that. So, if he can't even remember everything, there's no way I can. <laughs> it, was so, it was either one of the Song of Ice and Fire books or a different fantasy series where they used birds to pass messages, and I feel like it must have been one of the Song of Ice and Fire books. Someone was trying to send a message from somewhere, and somebody outside of the castle or something was trying to make sure they shot down all the birds that left, uh. so they couldn't get any messages out. That sounds familiar. I bet that is what where it's from. That it must be. Familiar. Yeah. That's a pretty good idea. Yeah. It's kind of mean, but it's like, I mean, what do the birds do? Unplugging someone's internet, but more blood. Yeah. Of course, then they could eat the bird. So I guess there's that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always the silver lining, Rosanna. <laughs> <laughs> What's for dinner? Raven again. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Locke gets to leave 
He's very relieved that he gets to. I'm sure he's escorted out very angrily by Solundry. Yeah. He goes to the Gilded Cloister, which sounds amazing, and I really yes. want one of these places. Me too. It's this amazing restaurant, and they have these, this kind of maze of booths. It's very quiet. All the booths Nobody are... Nobody can talk to you. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, all That's the, the best booths part. have leather. None of the attendants are allowed to speak. It's like the, what, the kind of, I don't want to say gentleman's club, but a club for gentlemen, like in Sherlock or the old English things mm-hmm. where no one's allowed to speak there. Yeah. And of course... weird. <laughs> yeah. John Watson and Sherlock always speak immediately when they go there to find Mycroft. <laughs> that is a... Did you say my crotch? I said my Croft. <laughs> oh, Sherlock's brother. <laughs> yes, Sherlock Holmes is looking for my crotch. <laughs> well, this is so loud. a really great connection because you're a little scratchy. <laughs> that's what it sounds like. And I was like, did I, did I miss something? I love that you that? assumed that's what I said when I said <laughs> my Croft when we were talking about Sherlock and you know his brother's name. Well, it just, I was just trying to clarify. Did she say Mycroft? No, no, she must have said Mycroft. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Sherlock ever called him that? Oh my god, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> We've just birthed a new meme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, Jean is there reading, and he's startled by Locke. Yeah, right, he is so not startled. <laughs> yeah. I would never believe that he could be startled by, by I mean, Locke. I think Locke is probably pretty good at being sneaky, but they've lived yeah. together for, what, 15 years, 20 years? A long time. So Locke might be good at sneaking up on people, but he's not sneaking up on this guy. I, I do think that it's, I do think it's put on as Jerome or Jerome. And now I just keep trying to make all of Jean's names into French sounding names. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. It is nice that they both chose names that start with their names. Their names, first letters. If I can make a sentence, that would be helpful. <laughs> no, that was very clear, Nick. You're so eloquent. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but Locke and Leoconto, Jean, Jerome, it's pretty smart. Locke also did Lucas, and I wonder if it's to make it easier for him to recognize hearing his fake name. It could be, and it's a good idea, really. I love I loved the initial back and forth between Locke and Sean. Is it done then? Am I successfully betrayed? Quite betrayed. <laughs> Absolutely sold out. A dead man walking. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> They're so happy that it's working. And then Locke starts to make fun of Jean for his his reading choices. He's reading some Lucarno romance novels, which I'm assuming is the equivalent of Danielle Steele. Fabio on the cover. <laughs> Which I'm sure just enhances Jean's capability for wooing his secret girlfriend. I agree. Wherever she is. I'm sure he had to leave her behind. Do you think Jean is ever going to get a real girlfriend? <sighs> I hope so. <laughs> what do you think she'll be like? I think she'll be like Locke. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. I sense some psychoanalysis here. Yeah. I don't know. That would make sense. I think sense. That, that Locke and Jean are, they um, they balance each other uh, in the okay. way that a romantic relationship could also work. That would make She's sense. She's probably not sweet. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. I guess Jean is sweet enough for two people. Yeah. Even though he's kind of a murderer, but I mean. <laughs> he's a very dangerous teddy bear. That's all. He is. You kill all those people, but they were all bad people. <laughs> Do you remember that? What was that? It was on, um, what was that? It was Jamie Lee Curtis and Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he was a spy. Uh-huh. Uh, it was like True Lies, I think. Did, don't you remember seeing oh, that? Oh, that's right. And she finally All finds I could think out... of was the spy who shagged me. No, <laughs> that wasn't right. <laughs> she finally finds out that he's like a spy and she said and you killed all those people and he said yes but they were all bad people (laughs) it was a good movie though really i say that about every movie you do i do too easy on movies i just want to give i just you know movies take a lot of work for the actors and the people that work on it and i just want to give them credit you know you did a good job you tried really hard (laughs) 
tried really hard. <laughs> Uh, I'm easy on movies, too, but not so I can give people credit, just because I just want to be entertained, and if I'm entertained, I'm happy. Me, too. I'm very willing to overlook a lot of stuff. <laughs> Me, too. I don't even have any qualifiers for that statement. I'm just very willing to overlook a lot of stuff. <laughs> it explains why we still get along, Rosanna. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I don't need to be a good sister. You just overlook all my crappy parts. I also have a really bad memory, so... Also helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so Jean and Locke talk for a while. They make conversation in the guise that they are Leo Conto and Jerome. We find out that Locke used to enjoy plays. Something he likes to do with Sabatha is not happy to be reminded of that fact. So we get another little, little teeny tiny mention of Sabatha. Yeah. Lynch is just keeping us on the hook here. The mystery, mystery woman. They've decided they're just going to relax about town for a while to avoid riling up Requin even more than he already is. They start walking, and a woman follows them into an alley. And very quickly, they realize they are surrounded by people with crossbows. And the woman knows not just about Locke's knife, but about Jean's hatchets. So when would she have found out about his hatchets? He has avoided fighting here, I'm sure. The only time I can think of that he had them out was at the night market during the whole Bonds Magi debacle. So do you think maybe... She's been following them for a while and saw that? I think that it's possible that an occasion has come up in the last two years that he needed to use them. And okay. may and maybe she has talked to the right people. Not the right people, but like the correct people. <laughs> Not capitalized R P. Right. The correct people. <laughs> uh it seems reasonable that the way they've sort of cornered them and taken them that she has some intel on them somehow. Yeah. Maybe she's got a scorpion hawk. I don't know. Oh, God, no. <laughs> uh. Maybe she's got something worse. Maybe she's got, like, a scorpion bear. Oh, my God. That wouldn't be very <laughs> that sounds... sneaky, though, probably. That sounds all a little ridiculous, because <laughs> the bear itself could just kill you. It doesn't need the poison. Well, it's God. overkill. <laughs> oh, my God. You're not doing it. <laughs> Oh, I'm the worst. You are the worst. <laughs> fired. How about a scorpion bunny? Oh, look at the little bunny. Let's pet the little bunny. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Locke and Jean have to give up their weapons. And Locke has a couple of knives. Jean has his hatchets plus at least three daggers hidden on him. I'm picturing him just continually handing over more and more weapons, mm -hmm. pulling out of the amount of unlikely places. Mm -hmm. I had thought I had seen this in a ton of different movies, and it turns out it's a, it's a trope. People call it the extended disarmament. <laughs> of course they do. Which is nice. But it's in a ton of stuff. It's in one of the Lord of the Rings movies, The Two Towers, where Aragorn and Gimli have to give up their weapons, and they just keep pulling out more stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. And then pull out a knife out of their pocket, and like, just endless. Yeah. yeah. They do that in a lot of movies, but... That one was fun because those guys were so serious so so often. Mm -hmm. They do funny stuff too, like loaded weapon and all that. But but it's it's nice when it it's a moment of levity. They get hooded and their hands get tied and they get put on a boat. Who do you think these people are? Are they Requins people? I do not think they're Requins people. Okay, why not? Because he just saw him. I think he was going to you know spend some more time investigating i guess before he went after them for real or decided to go after them okay so who are they i think they're new people that we don't know about yet. not somebody from Camor. i don't think they're from Camor. i also don't think they're anything to do with the bonds mages either oh all right i think that'd be more overt yeah i think that uh Locke and jean are good at irritating people so i think this is just a Somebody else know them so well. Irritated. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this is part of the Requin plan. Okay, it does seem like it. It would have needed a little more time for him to put something like that together. Yeah, because this happens not very long after Locke leaves. Right after he leaves this inspire. Yeah, I would think that Requin is probably you know gathering information before he just goes after them. Okay, what do you think Requin might find out? Do you think he's just going to find out in general what they've been doing. Do you think that they have specifically prepared for him to do background on them and have 
planted maybe little stories about themselves over town the past two years? I think that they have probably been living the way they want it to come out at this point this whole time. Because if if this was the plan all along, they would have known at some point somebody was going to be checking into them. Yeah, yeah. And I think they're pretty good at being careful to keep up uh, the facade when people are watching to where they've made these characters that they're playing very realistic. So I think they probably have, a, you know, two years of uh, history for Requin to find. And they have a lot of experience playing different people in public than they are in private. Mm-hmm. That's what they did basically since Father Chains took them in. How weird would it be if they suddenly had to just be themselves all the time? <laughs> They'd be so confused. It would probably take more work than not being themselves. <laughs> yeah. Lock lies so easily. Do you think that they know the people that are kidnapping them? Not the specific people because they don't recognize them, but do you think they know the people that they're going to go to on this boat trip? Um, Even if we don't know them yet? I think it's more likely that they do than they don't. Okay. But it's hard to say. I'm not really willing to commit any either way. Do you think there's a chance it might be a possible employer that Locke was talking about? Maybe in a different way? Then he explained it to Requin. I'm going to guess that maybe it's somebody from the time between Kamor and... Where are they? Telvar. Telvarar. Telvar. Somewhere between Kamor Talisham or and Telvarar. Yeah. Something maybe in that interim time. Or maybe right when they first got to Talvarar. Do you think they had their whole plan figured out before they came to Telvarar? I think probably yes. Or if not all of it, you know, 80% of it. That I feel like Locke probably knew what the what his goal was and most of the steps to get to it. Well, next episode, next week, we're going to discuss the next reminiscence called Best Laid Plans. What do you think? I'm really looking forward to the reminiscences in this book, and I'm kind of sad that they don't go all the way through, actually. Yeah, only five of them. Yeah, I think it's going to be hard to give me as much information as I want in just five. Mm. But I am excited to read the next one. Okay. What do you think best laid plans might be? Well, I think somebody made a plan and it got screwed up and... (laughs) I don't know. Typical. For as smart as Locke and Jean are, and for as amazing as their plans end up being and complex, they have a lot of stuff go wrong, it seems like. Well, I wonder if maybe what we're going to find out is that this plan that they're running right now with Requin was maybe not their first plan when they got to Talvarar. Oh, maybe okay. Locke had come up with an idea and a plan on how to do what he wanted to do and something got in the way of it. And this is maybe not a brand new plan that they're working on right now, but maybe like an updated plan. They had to make some changes to it. To make it work after maybe they got found out or maybe they saw somebody that they knew from Kamor that ID'd them as somebody else. Somehow, mm. I think what, what they started with had to be augmented into a new plan because it wasn't quite right. Okay. You ready for your top three, Rosanna? What's your category? My category is... The top three refreshments that I would like to try, and one that I would not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I would like to try the marzipan dragonflies. Oh, yeah. I don't even think I like marzipan, but they sound so cute. If it was in these adorable, delicate little dragonflies, Mm -hmm. I would want to try that. I would like to try a wine that changes color and flavor, like what Requin was drinking. That sounds sounds amazing. Super cool. And... (laughs) I would really like to try these likeness cakes that the boys got (laughs) at the place they're staying. Every single day they make desserts or treats that look like the people that are staying there. What? That's crazy. So then this is the part that I I laughed out loud. Um, And Jean are talking about how they've eaten all of their likeness cakes. (laughs) And Locke said, they died of consumption. I was actually at work when I read that, and I laughed out loud at my desk. (laughs) 
And I'm sure people were like, this is not a place where people laugh. I don't know what you're doing. Oh, I was thinking about a joke I heard earlier. (laughs) (laughs) I love that Jean had only eaten the legs so far, and it just made me think of chocolate Easter bunnies and people just eat the ears first. Yes, (laughs) yes, definitely. I think the fanciest likeness kind of cake closest thing to it that I've ever seen are like Mickey Mouse pancakes. (laughs) It's as close as I can get. (laughs) <laughs> it seems like so much work for food yeah it just seems it really like they does. put so much time and energy into it and then people just eat it i mean just they just it. put it in their mouth chew it up <laughs> it's crazy to me and it's done so those were the three refreshments that i would like to try the one dish that showed up in this chapter that i never ever ever need to try <laughs> stuffed eels Oh, that sounds gross. I, in general, don't like foods stuffed in other foods. Usually I'm kind of a purist that way. Uh, in so eel, I don't like fan? in any format. Oh, gosh, no. Why? Mm-mm. That's so strange. I do like stuffed mushrooms, uh, but not stuffed eels. That's gross. Yeah. So that's my top three. I'm like, now I want those lobster mushrooms we had on our Sestra Fiesta last year. Oh, my, oh my gosh. Those are, amazing. Those are so good. Oh man, those were good. <laughs> and you know, I don't, I don't eat a lot of shellfish um, because of yeah. just allergies. So when I get stuff like that, man, oh, it's good. Listeners, Rosanna and I go on a sister trip every year that we call our Sestra Fiesta. Thank you, Orphan Black, for that name. Well, for part of the name. Thank you, Helena. <laughs> yes, and we went to Lincoln City, our nice, cold, rocky Oregon coast. Oh, love, beautiful. And we ate the most amazing mushrooms with this lobster like it was like thicker than bisque i don't even want to call it it may be in like the top five tastiest things i've ever eaten it was it so good it was really good i mean the seafood at the coast all is always good but that was exceptional yeah. i need to eat it right now definitely let's work on some predictions what do you think the actual con is what do they actually want from requin why do they try to get in with him I wonder if there's something in the vault that is very valuable that isn't just money. Okay. Like what? Sabbath's address? (laughs) Like, (laughs) you know, a horcrux or something. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Like a little gold cup from Hufflepuff. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe something that is somehow historically important or important to Locke's family that we don't know anything about or a treatise on who the Eldrin were oh that would be cool maybe some sort of historical text maybe the Eldrin bible Ooh, something from Th- Theron throne maybe 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 how bonds magi become sorcerers Ooh. maybe they're not born that way maybe it's Maybelline no maybe, maybe they're maybe it is maybe. maybe it's some sort of <laughs> ritual they can do to make someone Maybe it's some sort of alchemical potion that they take when they're young. Maybe it's what whatever has kept Vercenza healthy yeah, all these yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So many ideas. I love it. Uh, yeah, I don't... It could, I mean, it could be a lot of different things. Yeah. I wonder if Locke has come at it this way because he has possibly realized that there is no way to get into it. He can't come up with a way to do it. So maybe he's trying to get Requin to trust him as an ally against this whoever is trying to get into it. And maybe somehow he's going to get Requin to let him into the vault. Maybe he's going to trick so him. So just a bigger version of the cons they ran in this in the lower levels of the Sinspire. You have to cheat the person, not the game. Exactly. And, and, and if that is the case, I think that's why that's where the story started, was to say, you know... He can't get into the vault. There's no way to break the vault. But there is a way to break Requin. Or there is a way to break... what? What's his gal's name? Solendry. Solendry. Or there is a way to break Solendry. Or... So all foreshadowing. Yeah, I think it's just the two of them that he's going to have to get through one or the other. Okay. I'm not sure how turning on Jean... Sorry. Turning on Jerome, (laughs) a.k.a. Jean, uh, fits into it. Unless... Locke wants to appear without support, like as somebody that has no one else to be loyal to, so possibly easier to ally with. I don't, I don't know. I think it, it might occur be... to me that he suggested he be the one to kill Jerome 
So if they wanted, if they decided they wanted Jean dead, then he might get a heads up about it. Mm. Oh, that's true too. I don't think that he wants to retire and find a woman. Well, I think he wants. <laughs> that was. I think he so might want to find a say. woman, but I think he might mean a specific one. So <laughs> he already knows what woman. Yeah, and maybe having Jean be on, you know, quote unquote, the other side. Uh, is a way for him, Jean, to be able to get into places or find information that Locke can't as his yeah, character. Okay. You know, if they can, if there are two sides of this, then they can each get information from each side and then share it. Yeah, makes sense. I like it. Question two. Where is Sabatha? Where is she? Does she ever come back? What the heck? Oh, I don't know. Uh... <laughs> you still think she's a ghost? <laughs> I just, I can't imagine that an author would introduce a character in thought and conversation only and never have the character actually show up. That's very strange. So I'm going to continue to think that eventually she'll show up. There are supposed to be seven books in the series, all told. Supposed to be. Yeah. I, I kept thinking at some point she was going to come in and save the day in the last book. or Or come in at the beginning of this book as a comfort or a friend or a co mourner a co mourner oh. of the of the other mm-hmm. boys i i just keep thinking that at some point she's going to be i don't know i don't know why she left unless it was just that she was mad at Locke, which could be but it seems like she's really holding a grudge for a long time <laughs> and not just against Locke. it's it's against jean too it's always felt to me like Chains just didn't quite know what to do with a girl, even though she was very talented, it sounds like. And so it always seems like she had a little more distance than the rest. She wasn't really a sister the way they were brothers. That has always been my impression. So maybe it's easy for her to stay away or easier. And not just because she may not be as close, but because it may be painful for her to have never quite belonged. Maybe. All right. Last question for you. In the prologue, it appeared that Jean betrayed Locke. With someone. Any more ideas about what happened? Or what is going to happen to get him to that point? I think it probably has a lot to do with this false story that Locke has given Requin about turning against Jean as Jerome. Though I'm not sure who these other two crossbow carriers are. Unless, unless they work for Requin... And Jean is saying that he went over Locke's head, or around him, I guess, and gave Requin a better offer than Locke was. And so now, instead of working with Locke, they're going to work with Jean. And Locke's the one that's going to be on the outs instead. So maybe maybe the idea was to get Locke on his side and then twist it around. Do you still think this is a trick yes. on Jean's side? <laughs> That means you still want it to be a trick. <laughs> do you actually really think? Yeah, I do. Okay. All right. We'll go with that. Any other predictions? Any questions you have that I may or may not answer? Oh, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> what are your major questions? I just am eager to know what the actual plan is, because I feel like if I find that out then I'll know what the ultimate goal is, and then I'll be able to figure out what what's driving them towards this and i always want to know that oh i have another question for you that i just re- remembered why do you think the book is called red seas under red skies you originally thought they'd be on some ship and we've we've seen them on a ship not much though well they're about to get on another one so maybe they will be for a while i don't know maybe it has something to do with sabbath's red hair mm. is it just a thinly veiled reference to does the carpet match the drapes no, God, no. <laughs> red seas under red skies or hair under red skies? And... Well, maybe the sky is red because it, there's a fire and maybe she, her hair is the red sea because she's laying on the ground. Is she dead? What? I don't know. People lay down on the ground without <laughs> being dead. Maybe she's laying on the ground to look up at the sky. Oh, so they're stargazing now. Maybe nice. the red sky is her red hair and the red seas is blood. My God, it's gotten morbid. Well, just because there's blood doesn't mean there's death. You could just be bleeding. It's, it's true. And 
and when we talk about red seas under red skies and it's like, oh, this weird ocean reference that makes no sense. I just keep thinking about <laughs> the prophecy for Bjorn in Vikings and how he's going <laughs> to sail in a water with no waves or something. A sea with no tide. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> water with no waves. Same. It's close. <laughs> no waves, no tides, whatever. <laughs> it's like, can't we just be literal, please? Just say what you mean. Are we talking about an actual <laughs> ocean or not? Prophecies are never literal. Ah. <laughs> so, I'm not sure why it's called that. I, I always think, you know, when you say, when you use the color red, you think fire, you think blood. So... That's kind of where I'm at. Now it's time for Cheek of the Week, where we talk about something awesome that we like and want to share with you. This time it's Rosanna's turn. What's your Cheek of the Week, Rosanna? My Cheek this week is a product that I think is called Sugru. Maybe Sugru. Maybe Sugra. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I've seen it written. I'm going to go with Sugru. Sugru? Sugru. Okay. It's S-U-G-R-U. It is called the world's first moldable glue. So pretty much what it is, it's like this putty stuff that you rub around in your hands until it warms up a little bit, and then you stick it on something, and if you leave it for 24 hours, it it hardens. Okay. But it's super cool because you can, like, people use it for a lot of different things. They've got this whole amazing Pinterest board about all the different ways you can use it. So it's waterproof, so you can, if you have a crack, like, in your washing machine, or if some of the rubber has come off of one of the wires in your dishwasher, you can use it on that. People use it to fix cords, you know, your cords at the end where the plastic starts to open and you can see the wires. Oh, You can wrap it around that. Um, It's heat resistant. It's cold resistant. It's removable. Even after it's set, after 24 hours, it can still be removed. And I have used it for a few things. Mainly, I've used it at work for decorating my desk. Um, I set some of it across the top of one of my monitors to hold these little figures that are the villains from Doctor Who. And I'll post a picture of that. Um, They're sort of like little Lego people, and you can actually switch their heads, which is hilarious. Hmm. But... I, they've, they've got like Lego feet, so there are holes in the bottom of their feet. So I ran the Sugru across the top and then I smashed them down into it. Sort of like, it's sort of like Play-Doh. And then overnight it firmed up. So now they're stuck on the top of my monitor so they don't fall off anymore. And then also eventually I can pop it back off so they're not permanent. I also use it to adhere magnets to the back of my Funko Pop dolls so I can hang them on my file cabinets. Oh, cool. Which I I really like to do. They're adorable hanging up like that. They're my favorite. And, oh, and then I recently bought a pack of Sugru. Oh, and it comes in a bunch of colors. You can get red and black and gray and white. I got some white to cover up these, uh, the end of some screws that were too long for this cabinet that I have. So they were sticking out into the cabinet. And you know when you have a little screw and you put your hand in the cabinet and it just like catches your skin every single yes. time? Yes. So I smashed a little bit of Sugru on there up around it and let it dry, you know, 24 hours. And now it's just this little molded piece of plastic around it and it's covered it completely. That's awesome. It's a really cool product. It does way more stuff than what I've used it for. Oh, they also have it in yellow, I guess. So I got mine at Amazon. Um, I also once purchased a packet of it at the container store. Sugru has a website also. So there are a lot of places you can get it and they have tons of resources and ways that you can use it. And it's super cool. Nice. That sounds awesome. It's so functional and I'm a big fan of function. Yeah. You're commonsensical. And even That's and, your throne Theron name. I am. I am commonsensical. And even if you don't think you need it, just go look at their Pinterest pages because they're just fun. <laughs> so... <laughs> All right, listeners, please visit our website to find information about all our Cheeks of the Week. And you can learn about our other podcasts, one where we talk about the TV show Vikings, and then also our new Something Cheeky Movies podcast, where we're talking about Wonder Woman and Spider-Man, and it's super fun. You can also send us questions and feedback at the website, and you can find out ways to support the show if you're interested. Our website is somethingcheekypodcast.com. That's our episode. Please leave us a review on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at SomeCheek, Facebook.com slash SomeCheek. 
and Instagram at Something Cheeky Podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Do-ga-da-dum, do-ga-da-da-da-dum.